Sometimes we sing songs about being thankful, right? But how many of you are truly thankful that you have been redeemed, amen? That God has done a move in your life. Oh, God, may we never get tired of singing that hell lost another one, amen? Amen. Lord, we're just thankful for you this morning. We're thankful, oh God, that even though we didn't deserve it, God, you still welcomed us with open arms. Oh God, we're so thankful for you this morning. We're thankful for the move that you're doing in this church, God. We thank you for the move that you're doing in your people, in your children, for the move that you are making in our nation right now, God. We're just so thankful for you. We're so thankful for you, God. And Lord, we just pray this morning that you would have your way, that you would have your way in us, that you would have your way in this body for such a time as this, oh God. Oh God, we surrender our hearts and our minds, our bodies, our all of our distractions to you right now in this moment, God. We surrender it all to you, Lord. Hallelujah.
to work, God, in the lives of my children. God, I need you to work in the lives of my family. I don't know what it is, church, but I know that the Lord wants you to surrender that thing. He wants to move in that area of your life, and you, but you got to surrender.
the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. How many of you know that he is still the same deliverer that he was back then? He is the deliverer now. How many of you know that he provided back then? He's going to provide now. Come on, church. We can't just sing about the way maker he is. We got to know he's the way maker. when we can't see it, even when we don't feel it, God. Even when I don't see what you're working, even when I don't feel what you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't feel what you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. no matter what we are facing, no matter what we may be going through, your promise is what we stand upon, that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. God, that you uphold us with your right hand. Thank you, Lord. I don't know who it is in this room that needs to be encouraged and reminded of who you are this morning. But oh, may we, may we be reminded that you are an unchanging God, that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you that you are Alpha and Omega, that you are the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. Oh, we're so thankful, oh God. We are so thankful, oh God. Is it in your... 
your community? Is it in your schools? Is it in your job? When we sing that this morning, when we say that he's the light in the darkness, are we carrying his light, church? Are we carrying his light into that darkness? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for speaking this morning, for being the promise keeper, Lord. That even when the doctors say one thing, we know that you made a promise. You made a promise, Lord. And we stand upon the promise, not upon the report, God. I don't know who these are for this morning, but I, I hear the Lord speaking. I hear the Lord speaking. the Lord is wanting to do a new thing in this place. He's wanting to do a new thing in this place. And he's been speaking for the last several weeks that I've been here. Pastor Rob, with your permission, Pastor Rachel. Hallelujah. And one of the things that the Lord spoke even through my sister Tasha was that he was plowing the ground in this place. But the Lord spoke and said that the ground that he desires to plow is our hearts. It's not just this place, but it's our hearts that he desires to plow. He has good seed that he's wanting to drop in there, church. He's got some good things that he wants to be laid into good ground. I don't know who it is that may be struggling this morning with that surrender that full surrender, whatever it is that you're afraid to let go, let it go, let it go. I came here to tell you this morning to let it go. Place it at the feet of Jesus. He is faithful to deliver. He is faithful to restore. He is faithful to provide, church. We don't just sing songs to sing them. We sing songs to declare in the atmosphere, to shift what is going on in the room invite God's presence and his power to move. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Have your way. Have your way, oh God. Have your way, oh God. Have your way, oh God. Hallelujah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working.
Jesus, we bless you. Jesus, we honor you. We magnify your holy name. King of kings and Lord of lords. Some of you might be like, well, I don't sing. Well, now's your time to talk to him. Thank you, Lord. Tell him how good he is. God, I thank you. God, I worship you. God, I worship you. God, I worship you. God, I worship you. I magnify you. King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, we honor you. We thank you that you are the way maker. Not just what you've done in the past and not what you're doing now. But Lord, I thank you that you're already in our tomorrows and you've already made the way. You've already made the crooked places straight. We just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. So God, we pray. We pray for every person in the room, those who have joined us online. God, I pray that you would touch their hearts, touch their minds. I pray right now they would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. Lord, your plan for the now moment that we're in. God, we pray that you would comfort those who are dealing with challenges now in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would strengthen their hearts. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit, your powerful presence will be with each person here today. God, we thank you that you meet every need relationally, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, and spiritually, Lord, in this room. You see all the needs of your people, and we thank you, Lord, that you're working. We thank you, Lord, that you're making the way. So, Lord, we pray for this nation right now. with all the junk and with all the funk that's going on even with with politics and the political scene God we take authority over those things which would divide us the church the big C God we thank you that we stay unified I thank you Lord that your people hear your voice and a stranger's voice they'll not listen to Thank you for wisdom and for direction, Lord, even as we enter another election cycle. God, let the church not be deceived. Let us stand up and be the church, the body of Christ you've called us to be for this moment. So God, let us not be about donkeys and elephants and anything in between. But for this cause, the cause of Christ. So Lord, as we do, as we do have the honor and privilege to vote over the next several months, God, let us vote according to your word, but also by the Holy Spirit. Not by what I do and don't like personality-wise or whatever. But God, by the Holy Spirit, lead us, we pray. Let us not be deceived. God, we pray for this nation. And I thank you, God, even within the next eight months, going into 2025 and the first quarter. Let us remember today, and every time we sing this song, that you're the way maker. Regardless of what we see, what we hear, and how it makes us feel. We thank you for the promises of God that they are yes and amen to us. But Lord, concerning the next eight months leading into the first quarter of 2025, we plead the blood of Jesus over your church. God, we pray that let us... grow stronger. Let us come together in prayer more fervently. The big C church, Father. That, Lord, as things might appear to look one way, 
we thank you, Lord, that in you, in you, if our eyes are on you, fixed on you, not looking behind, not looking to the left or to the right, but if our eyes are fixed on you, that all is well in the household of faith. So God, we plead the blood of Jesus over every family in this church, from the youngest to the oldest to those who aren't even in the room yet. God, we thank you for divine protection. We thank you for the promises that we have in you. That he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God, we thank you that ministering angels are encamped all around us. That no matter what some, if they get on an airplane, a bus, wherever, they're driving wherever, Father, in Jesus' name, that we are protected by the blood of Jesus. We declare no weapon formed in fashion against us can prosper. We declare that we will all safely get through to the other side, especially in our faith over the next eight months. Lord, help us not to let our hearts be troubled by what we see. And show us how to pray and what to say and what to speak to it. Lord, we'll be faithful to do that. We'll cooperate with heaven and we'll do that, Lord. But God, we thank you for this nation. We thank you, Lord, for the president, the highest office to the lowest office to the local officials. God, we plead the blood of Jesus over every leader. And we thank you that any plan, schemes, devices of the enemy be thwarted, exposed, and will not come to pass. God, we plead the blood of Jesus over every candidate that's running for office. Lord, as there's just something that's been unleashed, in Jesus' name we say not on our watch, whether we like the person or not. God, we pray for peace now. We pray for divine protection. We speak life over them all. We pray for our military for our armed forces and those who are serving this great nation. All the men and women, God, we plead the blood of Jesus over them. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. No weapon formed or fashioned against them can prosper. That as some begin to take steps to go into the front lines of battle, as they embrace the calling to do what you've called them to do for this time, God, we think that they're protected and they are covered by the blood of Jesus. God, we thank you for Sebastian. We thank you for Chris Marquis. We thank you for Emily, Father, Fujimura, Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you. In Jesus' name, that they are protected and covered. That no matter wherever they go, whatever they do, Father, and all of our other friends that are serving, Lord, that you would cause them to be in the right place at the right time. And we declare no harm will come to them, Father, but they'll stand up for your word as a believer for such a time as this. We thank you for a great revival, a great awakening, a great move of God that's already begun now. Lord, let it continue to blow and let it continue to flow, Father, in this time, in this season. We thank you for souls coming into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. God, we lay everything down at the altar. Every thought, every grievance, every attitude, every move, every whatever, Father, we lay it down at your altar. And we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in our lives, in this church, in this nation, as it is in heaven. So God, we thank you for it. And it's with great expectation, God, we thank you that you'll see us through to the other side, still standing. So Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, don't you love it when the Lord comes in like that?
What were we doing there? We're praying about something because God's preparing us. I don't know what's happening eight months from now, but he does. And we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and that's what that moment was, following what he said. So if we continue to pray, there's some things that we can kind of push back a little further. The plans of the enemy, we can kind of push that back. If we're not able to push those things back, then we can make sure that we're listening to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will always cause us to be in the right place at the right time, at the right moment. Amen? So you don't have to be moved by what you see or what you hear. We have a covenant with God Almighty. The one who said, let there be light. The one who put the stars in place, the ocean in place. He said, let us make man in our image. If he can talk to those things and they can listen to him, how about you and me? Can we hear the voice of God? Can we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? He will always cause us to be in the right place at the right time in this now moment. So don't let your heart be troubled because God's still working. Amen? Awesome. Well, this time we'd like to dismiss our kids and break out you give them a great big hand and before you're seated go ahead and shake the hands of two or three people and welcome them to the house of the Lord today. Good morning. Welcome to church, everybody. We love you. appreciate you. I just want to thank you all for being here today and for those who helped out this week. And you see there's definitely some changes, and, but we appreciate the team. We had a whole crew came in. They left at 6.15 this morning, I think it was, to drive back to their various locations in Virginia and Tennessee. But we had a crew that came in and took a home mission trip and did some things and you can see we're not done making some changes yet. We're going to add more lights and things like that. But I just want to thank the team. There's people that spent hours up here, about 80 plus hours this week. 15 hour days, just hammering it out. And whether you like it or you don't like it, whether it's growing on you or it will grow on you, thank you. I want to go ahead and just take a moment, and I want to thank every person that prayed, that made food, that worked their tails off, because you all are amazing. This was, this doesn't happen in five days. Think about that. The Lord sent help, and yeah, come on. And we're going to be faithful with what the Lord has us do. And we're not done yet. We're going to make some other adjustments and things like that. But I appreciate everyone that has helped out and worked hard. Uh, it was a week. It was fun. Climbing ladders with people, getting to know them. And I know the screen's big, right? I got a really good deal. A few hundred dollars, actually. So it's a miracle from God. So God did some things, and this new projector, it's got 46 hours on it, paid a third of the price. So God just really lined some things up for us, and we're, you know, always good stewards, right? But thank you, everybody. Can we give it up for everyone that <laughs> prayed, that made lunch, that brought lunch? Yeah, come on. That worked hard. Thank you all. And then he's not even here today. But Miss Debbie, can you let Ronnie know how much we love and appreciate him? See, Ronnie and Mikey, behind this screen, there's a whole another thing that you're not even seeing. It's a whole wood that Ronnie just, Mikey said, Dad, do you understand what Ronnie did? 
Ronnie mapped this thing out in his head, and he sketched out this thing because the frame wasn't as strong as we'd like. He built this wooden frame and put it into the wall, and it was like this massive structure. He and Mikey, and Mikey was his apprentice, and it was so good. But Ronnie worked his tail off, and he's just brilliant. The next time you see Ronnie, if you have Ronnie's number, I want you to text him, call him, say, hey, we love you, and thank you for what you did because it looks amazing. But welcome to church, everyone. So good to see you. If you're a guest of ours right around the seat near you, there's a Connect card. I'd love to have you fill that out just to have record of your visit, keep you updated, all the wonderful things going on here at church. Um, if you have a prayer request, a praise report, church family, or uh, our guest today, let us know. We want to be praying with you. And if you have a praise report, we love those amen moments when God comes through. And every week we hear testimonies of, of how God is coming through and bodies are being touched and shoulders are being healed and back pain gone. And you know, it might not seem like it's a big deal to you unless you're the one going through the pain, right? So God is faithful. God is good. But thank you all. We love you. Welcome to church this morning. This morning we have uh, one of my favorite preachers, actually my favorite preacher, and it's Pastor Rachel. So would you come on up on and break it down? You got a lot of things. You need some help? You got this? All right, I'll give you that. She worked hard this week, too. Come on, 80 plus hours. Well, welcome to church. As you can see, things have shifted a little bit. I'm pretty sure Mr. Tom has painted every single wall in this church at one point on this last week. He, he was our roller, and he just rotated walls all week. Um, it was a cool week. One of the things, we're doing a series right now called Building for Generations, and one of the things that was so cool is we had our 12-year-old up here this week working, and there were people as old as 77 here working. There were multiple generations here building for the next generation. Pretty cool stuff. So um, thank you to everybody who, again, who painted and bought delicious desserts for us and fed us and cleaned. And John was here till 1.30 last night. There were all these little funny, weird things that we, these little plates on the wall. He had to go to four different stores. Mr. Charlie made these panels, designed them, went to 50 stores to find the fabric. And I mean, we have an amazing group of people here. And if this is what it is in a week, can you imagine the things that can be accomplished with a team like this? I'm pretty excited. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you about building for generations. I'm not going to talk long because Pastor Rob took all my time, <laughs> but also because our team is probably going to fall asleep if I talk too long. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about how God is in the business of rewriting stories. Before I do that, my little brother, he's not really little. He's taller than me. Ben is here with his girlfriend. Wave to everybody. I know a lot of you have met my older brother. This is my younger brother. I say, I let people guess now. I used to get mad because we're only 18 months apart if people thought I was younger. Now when they think I'm younger, I'm like, yeah, now nah, he's old. <laughs> so he's here. You'll greet him on your way out. Um, but funny thing, I'm talking about dad this morning. So maybe your story is kind of like my dad's. God is in the business of rewriting stories. My dad was a surprise baby to an older mom. I think she was probably around 40 or real close to it when she had him. And this was a long time ago. That wasn't the thing back then. And so she was, he was the child, a surprise baby. She already had three older children. My aunt, his oldest sister, was 20 years older than him. In fact, she was like our grandmother growing up. So she was 20 when he was born, his oldest sister. Um, when my dad was only 13, his dad died. So he was young. He was just hitting middle school. And then his mom was a drinker. I think she was probably an alcoholic from the stories I've been told. I think this probably occurred, you know, after her husband died. So she died when she was 19. So he, my dad, had a great sense of humor. He could pop a one line like nobody's business. I mean, just right zing ya, right like that. Get it every time, hit that punchline. And he was the life of the party. But, you know, he didn't know Jesus. By the time he was 30, he'd already been married and divorced, and he was pretty much an alcoholic. A functional one, but pretty much an alcoholic. Drunk all weekend, get it together to go to work during the week. Well... One day, he, he divorced his first wife, married my mom, 
And my mom was watching Billy Graham and got born again. When she got born again, my dad got born again. And what happened is his whole story changed after that. Whole story changed. He received Jesus, never drank again, and began to follow Jesus. In fact, he went to Bible college. His whole story changed because of a decision. And that decision changed the trajectory of my entire family. In fact, several of us are Bible college graduates. I'm in full-time ministry. My brothers have done things, all kinds of things in ministry. Had that decision not been made and he continued on the path that he was and hadn't allowed God to rewrite his story, our stories would be very different as his children. Because God is in the business of rewriting stories. Amen? And when we make those decisions, our children and our children's children are affected by it. The children are always watching. So, amen? Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. This is the message. I like the message because it's a little spicy. All right, you ready? Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says this. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished the race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through will shoot adrenaline right through your souls. Isn't that awesome in the message? Now I'm going to read it in the tran verse 2 in the translation. You probably haven't memorized it. You ready? And <laughs> therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, as she was talking about this morning, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author. What does an author do? They write stories. Amen? The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is writing your story. Please stop taking the pen. God rewrites stories. It's funny how in the Bible we all know the stories and there's the main characters and those are the ones that we think about most in the story and if there's like a peripheral person especially me I just kind of don't pay attention to that person I'm like whatever the big person in the story is Moses forget these other people well it's funny how as you study the scriptures over and over again you begin to see things because the word begins to study you and you begin to understand things and and pick up on things about different characters that you didn't even notice before because the Word of God is alive, it's active, it's operating. And so there's always more for you to know. It never gets old, it never gets tired, it never gets, it never gets stale. There's layers in these stories in Scripture. So God wants uh, to use this church to be part of rewritten stories. We want to see people go from being zeros. That's totally something they say in Boston. They're like, that dude, he's a zero. In fact, the first time I did that, I almost fell over laughing. One of my friends said that from Boston. I'm like, what? He goes, that dude, he's a zero. But we want to see people going from being a zero to a hero. Amen? He wants to use each person in this room to help someone come to know who Jesus is. Your example, your love walk, the amount of grace that you extend to, to others, it can be a turning point in someone's story. It can. 
Have you ever met someone that's so full? The person I think of is my friend Barbara Arbo. She's a mentor to me. We had her in to speak at the tea, but I've known her since about 22 years old. That lady, every time I'm around her, I want to know Jesus more. What a testimony to be said about you. Every time I get around them, I just want to know Jesus more because, I'm, because of how they act, that love they demonstrate, that kindness. Your example, your love walk, the amount of grace you extend to others can be a turning point in someone's story. Your actions can be a demonstration of the love of God, and his love is like a magnet. It draws people to change. The Bible says that the goodness of God does what? It draws people to repentance. That means to change, to make a change. Amen? So let's look at um, Numbers 12, 1 and 2. I'm going to do the fast version of this story. Numbers 12, 1 and 2. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Now Miriam and Aaron were his siblings. Because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had, he married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, "Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses?" They're totally talking smack about their brother, is what they're doing. Ha, has he not spoken through us also? Like he thinks he's the stuff. Why does he think he's the stuff? Right? That's what they're. This is the conversation they're having, and the Lord heard it. Now the man, Moses, was very humble, more than all the men on the face of the earth. So in the next little part of this passage, God is harshly reminding Miriam and Aaron that he chose Moses, that Moses was a prophet, and that they were not doing a good thing and speaking against the man of God. There are certain people who've dedicated their life to talking about ministers and writing mean letters and I'm not saying that there's no accountability in all of those things. But I will say this. The Bible says to touch not God's anointed. I'd be real careful what you say. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Just be real careful. The, I'm not saying no accountability. I'm not saying people aren't human. I'm not saying any of that. But you got to be careful. People who dedicate their lives to write trash about other ministers, I don't think I want to be near the throne room when they come up, their turn comes. All right, that's free. Um, so anyway, they're talking trash against Moses, who God had chosen to be the prophet, to lead his people out, and God got angry. So verse 9, so the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from the tabernacle, Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Aaron turned toward Mir Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said, O oh my Lord, don't lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please don't let her be as one dead whose flesh is consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. Like a stillborn is one of the translations. So as Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O oh God, I pray. Then the Lord says to Moses, if her father had put spit in her face, would she not be shamed for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days, and afterward she'll be received again. So she was shut out of the camp, and people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. They wouldn't leave. And after the people removed from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. The people of Israel, their plan had been to move forward, but they refused to go without Miriam. Even though Miriam did something she really should not have done, they weren't going to leave without her. They refused to leave and move forward without her. Why? Miriam is the one who put Moses in the basket and watched over him until he got to safety in the river. There's a whole generation of Israelites that would still be in slavery had Miriam not put him in the basket, done what her mom said. There was risk involved in that. During that time, they were killing babies. They were killing boy babies, and they were trying to preserve his life. And Miriam took a risk for her mom and went and put that baby and made sure he was safe. But there was such destiny on him. What if she didn't obey? What if she didn't obey? there's a generation now they're messed up drugged up drunk they're so confused with toxic gender ideology and indoctrination living empty lives we can't leave them behind because they're tripped up in sin we can't be like uh whatever and move on oh they made a mistake we're out we are going to stand with them and get them to safety amen it's our job 
We as the people of God and as a congregation have to refuse to leave them behind just like the Israelites wouldn't leave Miriam behind because of her mistake. God was, Moses stuttered, Aaron spoke for him. They get a lot of credit in that story. You don't hear much about Miriam. She's like a sideline. Like, I have to like look her up to remember what she even did. I mean, that lady's in the Bible. What did she do again? But here's the thing. Had she not obeyed, the Israelites would have stayed even longer in the wilderness. They would have stayed even longer in Egypt. They never would have got delivered in the first place. She obeyed, and that obedience was a chain reaction for a whole generation of Israelites. Amen. God didn't see her failure. He saw the good. She made a big mistake by speaking against the man of God that God chose to lead the people. But they prayed over her that she would be saved, and God saved her. She had come so far. She'd done good. And so they said, God, just heal her. Just heal her. She made a comeback. And she got to go with the people. She didn't leave out exiled because of a mistake. We have to refuse to leave the lost ones behind. That's actually, I don't know which part of the branch of the government, the army or whatever it is, but leave no man behind. It's part of the, they sign a thing. We're not leaving anybody behind, right? We don't leave people behind. There's a generation that has to come to know Christ, and, and they want to see his power. They're destined for greatness. Greatness. God isn't finished with you, and he's not finished with your story. He is not finished with this generation. We have to be the ones who stand in the gap, the ones who love them and not judge them, but point them to Jesus. That's what they're looking for anyway. When I was um, in Bible college, I was studying to be, I don't know why, but a youth pastor. Thank God I didn't have to do that my whole life. That would have been rough. Um, but I'm in this group of teenagers. I never really got in a big bunch of trouble growing up. I went to Christian school. Like, the most trouble you get in is because you laughed in class when you were supposed to be quiet. You know what I mean? But here I am with all of these teenagers. The youth group that um, we were ministering was like, I don't know, like 300 kids. It was crazy. And I remember sitting there one day thinking, I have nothing to offer these kids. Like, I know the Bible. I know Jesus loves me. I can quote them some scriptures. Pretty sure they're not going to think that's cool. And they've got all these problems. And I remember praying about it. And I'm like, I can't help them. Like, God, I think you made a mistake, is what I said. Like, why am I here? Like, I can't help these people. And he said, just point them to me. Just get them to me. If you get them to me, I'll take care of it. All the answers are in his presence. Amen? Just get them to me. Just point them to Jesus. The outbreaks of revival that we're seeing on campuses across the nation prove to me that this generation is not a lost cause. It's proof. It, it proves that there's, there's the hope for tomorrow. There's a longing in the heart of this generation for something more than empty religion, half-hearted performances, and fake Christianity. They want to see the power of God in demonstration, just like you've seen. Amen? As a church family, we want to do everything to point not just the next generation, but all generations to Jesus, to equip them with the word of God, teach them how to follow the spirit of God. I believe God desires to see restoration in families. In fact, some of the changes that we will still be making that most likely will happen this week will make it so we have room to have people come in and do all kinds of different things to minister to families because God ordained the family before he ever ordained the church. And there has been a violent attack on families. The divorce rate in Christian families is as high as it is in the world. What are we doing to help families be healthy? What are we doing to support single moms? What are we doing to help families? There's such an attack on our children. Parents need help because their parents did not have iPads to deal with and codes to lock their phones off with and all this techie stuff you got to figure out that they're smarter than you about and can get around whatever you just figured out and took you six days, takes them 10 minutes to hit a button and figure it out. We have to equip families 
for these days. Amen? And so even us bringing in chairs and doing some other things is going to make it so we can do some things with round tables and do some different things in here that we couldn't do the way it is right now to reach more people and to minister to families. I believe in the last days that you will see a revival in the church because of ministry to marriages and families. Amen? So God ordained the family before he ever ordained the church, and the enemy is working really hard to, de to destroy families. Our kids see this all the time, that the, we're, they're like, Mom, almost all our friends, we're like the only ones whose parents are still together, especially now that they're in high school. They're like, we're it. <laughs> it's just a common thing now. And the church needs to be a supply and a resource to families. And it has a lot to do with building for generations. In fact, everything. We want to build strong children so we don't have to repair broken adults. We want to invest in marriage conferences and family conferences and counterattack the plan of the enemy. He's a God of restoration. Whatever happened, happened. But he still wants health and wholeness and families to be okay regardless of whatever's happened. We had a family in the church that we planted across town that had four generations that would come to church together. And I remember there was the great-grandpa, the grandpa, the kids, and their kids. And they'd sit together. And that is what it's going to look like in heaven. Not just one, not just two generations, but the whole family. Amen? How cool would it be if your grandkids and your great-grandkids were here, sitting with you on the row in a couple years? The, and the cool thing was they were all serving, all involved, all committed. They were at prayer. It was awesome. And that is what we want to see here. Amen? Because we're building for generations and God is still writing your story, young, older, in between, you're also called to be a part of other people's stories. You know, our flesh desires for things to be the same. And there's certain personality types, when you take a personality type, they, the average person doesn't like change, but there's certain personality type, they hate change. They're wearing the same haircut they had since 1972, they've got the same shoes, and they just buy them in a different color, and that is like really radical if they get them in another color. I mean, they like things to be the same. It, <laughs> He couldn't even be married to me if he liked things to be the same. I like to move things. Um, but here's the thing. Each chapter of your story is supposed to be different. They're not all supposed to be the same. There should be new people, new places, new experiences, growth, life transformation happening throughout your story. If your story is a book at the end of your life, that should be happening in every chapter. There might be a couple similar chapters, but if we're growing in God and going from faith to faith and glory to glory, the chapters change. We change because we are being transformed. It should not look the same. It shouldn't look the same. Something's not right if it's the same. I'm going to make a little bit of a bold statement. We have to refuse to allow comfort and familiarity to become an idol in our lives. Refuse to allow comfort and familiarity to become an idol in your life. What do I mean by that? Because you've always done it this way, you almost worship it. <laughs> it's an idol. We all have these things in our lives, and we don't even recognize it. They're blind spots is what we like to call them. Refuse to allow that comfort and ease and uh, just sit here because you'll still be sitting there in 30 years. You'll be sitting there in 40 years. It is such a ploy of the enemy. When we got ready to transition out of the ministry that we were on staff with for 14 years, it was hard because it was just easy. We were on autopilot. I could have done that another 30 years. It wasn't even hard for me. I mean, done it for so long, we're good. You know, my family was there. It was comfortable. I loved the town that we lived in and my kids were being raised in. I was super happy with it. It would have been easier just to be comfortable. But if I knew if I chose that, I would be miserable. 
because I wouldn't have obeyed God, and in 10 years, it, I wouldn't be able to leave. I'd, I'd be in too deep. And the thing is, when we allow comfort and familiarity to become an idol in your life, you stop growing. It keeps you out of the great adventure that God created for your life. It's, it's an easy trap of the enemy, especially in our American culture, because we're real comfortable here. I mean, if the chair is not comfortable and the latte is not hot enough, we're out. We're going to the next store, right? So let's look at this. Hebrews 12, 12 through 17. This is the message again. So don't sit around on your hands. No more dragging your feet. Clear the path for long-distance runners so no one will trip up and fall, so no one will step in a hole and sprain their ankle. Help each other out and run for it. It is time to go for it. We are at this pivotal place in history, and all that hesitating is, I have a personality, I'm a hesitator because I'm an analyzer, and I've had to stop hesitating and just do it. There's something about the way we're all training our kids to like ask all these questions that's also training them to not obey. And when the Lord tells you to do something, you get up and do it. You don't hesitate and think of 92 reasons why you can't. You just do it because he said to. And that hesitation can keep us from moving forward in the plan of God and like spinning around like a top in a circle. And he's calling us to move forward in this day and in this hour more than ever before. It's not a time to hesitate when we hear his voice. It's a time to say, yes, sir, what do you want? I'm doing it. So run for it. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter discontentment. A thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. Watch out for the Esau sy syndrome, trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. Boom! <laughs> right? I had never read this in the message before. I'm like, that's pretty good. <laughs> you well know Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing, but by then it was too late, tears or no tears. That's worthy to read a couple times, right? That's pretty, pretty good stuff in there. My dad's story changed the day that he was born again. And I remember as a little kid, we grew up Baptist, like super conservative Baptist, like super conservative. Uh, not like these cool Baptist churches up the street. <laughs> um, and so I remember being a kid, and he'd have his hymnal out, and he'd be singing, um, this is my story, this is my song, Blessed Assurance, praising my Savior. And he'd get this big smile on his face. He loved that song. And I, years later, in fact, I was listening to someone else sing it. Someone sent me that song, a re redo of it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I know why. You, it took me a 40 years to figure that out. I know why he liked that song, because God changed his story. This is my story. It's a story of blessing. It's a story of redemption. No wonder he loved that song. So our stories are supposed to be changing. Whose story are you going to be a part of? We're building for generations. We're imparting into the next generation. In Psalms 145.4, it says, Generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells stories of your mighty acts. Who are you telling your stories to? What younger person behind you are you telling the story of the time that God provided for you? What person are you sharing how he provided your need, how he healed your body? How are you sharing those stories? Because they need to be planted as seed into the generations to come. Amen? Hebrews 11, 1 through 2 says this, The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. 
what we see created by what we don't see. This passage, Hebrews 11, is one of my favorites in the whole Bible. It's often called the Faith Hall of Fame. I mean, if you got your name in this chapter, you did something, and it was big. I don't believe it's truly finished, this chapter. I think it's still being written. I think there'll be some of your stories in there where you stood and trusted and believed God and trusted him in faith, and he worked and he moved. Our stories are still supposed to be written just like these people in Hebrews 11. What I love about this is that these are men and women who put their trust in God. They obeyed even when it cost them. They took a risk sometimes a risk of even their life to obey what God told them to do. They trusted him. They made the choice to trust God anyway, even though the odds weren't in their favor, the circumstances weren't lining up, the threats were real. These men and women, we're still talking about the men and women in chapter 11 of Hebrews today. Those are the sermons you're hearing us preach on Sunday. It's probably somebody from the, the Hall of Fame. Why? Because they chose to believe God. They didn't back down, and they did what was right, even though it wasn't easy. Amen? We have to pass this kind of faith on to our children. They have to know the promises of God. They need to know how to trust God, how to walk in the blessing of favor of God. We have to model this and teach this to the next generation. Somebody taught you. They have their own giants to slay, their own mountains to move, amen? And we have to show them the tools outlined in the word of God and demonstrate how to use them so they can be victorious, amen? Amen. We're living in the most exciting time in the earth. This is the part of God's story that the men and the women in the Bible were waiting for. They were waiting for where you are right now. You're like, it's kind of a hot mess here. I'm not really sure why they were waiting. But they were waiting for this day when you're right on the edge of the finish line. They've been waiting. And this is the part of God's story where they long to see, and you got chosen to be a part of it. How awesome is that? I mean, we can go around talking doom and gloom and how the world is a big, hot, disgusting mess. And I mean, just the news this week, you're like, what in the world? Feels like a yo-yo, right? But you get to be part of this last leg of the race. There's not another generation that's ever lived on the earth that's as close to the finish line as you are. That's pretty cool. There's not one. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16 says this, and I'm wrapping up. Each one of these people of faith died, not yet having in hand what was promised, but they still believed. How did they do it? They saw it off in the distance. They waved their greeting and accepted the fact that there were transients in this world. People who live this way make it plain that they're looking for their true home. If they were homesick for the old country, they could have gone back anytime they wanted, but they, were far, they knew they were headed for a far better country than that heaven country. You can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. But you're going to get to see what they long to see. You get to be part of what they only dreamed of. You and your choices to be on the sidelines or to get in the race. Will you help build for generations? Will you make room for people that aren't here yet? Well, like, how do I do that? You pray and you invite. That's how you make room. You pray and you invite. It's not even hard. Pray and invite. Make room for them. Make room for them here spiritually. Make room for them by inviting them and bringing them in and having them come, especially to some of the things like next week is a family week. That is an awesome week to bring people because it's going to be a lot of fun and it's just lighthearted and fun and people will enjoy coming. It's an easy, easy entrance, easy on-ramp. So will you help build for generations and make room for the people that aren't here yet so they can know and learn how to walk by faith? Will you be a part of building for generations? He is calling us to grow. You know, sometimes we can get stuck in a chapter because it's familiar. But God's calling us, just like she said this morning. We didn't even talk. Like, everything she said is in my sermon. But, like, to a new chapter. Um, <laughs> that's so cool. A new season, a fresh beginning of growth and changes. He wants you to be all in. 
not half in, not in a spectator position. Those are different positions. I can go into a game or a service even, and I can be a spectator. I'll look at, because I'm a pastor, I'm looking at the, the decor. I'm looking at, oh, I like how they did that. You know, I'm taking pictures in my mind. <laughs> I can sit and spectate, or I can participate. Those are very, very different things. Amen? He wants us to be all in and fully participating in this last leg of the race when Jesus returns. You don't want to be the guy on the bench for the finish line. He wants to change and rewrite your story, and then he wants you to go tell someone because it will change their life. Plant those seeds. People are waiting on you to write that next chapter, to leave the struggle behind and to move forward. Amen? With God to share your story, to share his goodness, to share those faith victories with the next generation. And will he be able to count on you? Will he be able to count on you to share those stories? It's not hard to tell a story. It's not hard to share these things with people, and it can change their life. Have you ever had someone do that for you? I have. I had people who poured into me. They would tell me the stories of the miracles. I worked for a traveling minister, and they would just sit, and I was much younger than them, probably about they were old enough to be my grandmothers, really. And they would sit and tell me the stories of the miracles they would see and all these great things God would do as they traveled all over the country and did crusades. I've never forgotten that. They planted a seed in me to want to see God move. Amen? So people are waiting on you to write that next chapter. Can he count on you? He is faithful through generations. I'm going to have the team come up. Um, He's not going to fail. We're going to choose today to remove all the barriers, all the things that are in the way to set aside religious traditions and choose to be known as a person of faith and to teach our children and our grandchildren what it means to trust God. Amen? To believe his promises and watch them come to pass. Amen. He is faithful, amen, and there are good seeds that are getting ready to be planted here in good ground. It is time to grow, amen. It is time to grow. It is time to reach our community. It is time to reach the next generation, and we're going to do it, amen, amen. Well, if you would, bow your head, close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and you have not ever received Jesus into your life and you're ready to start a new chapter. You're ready to begin a new life with God. Maybe you've not made that commitment to serve him with your whole heart and everything you got. Today you can make a decision to do that and in doing that, your whole story can change. It's one simple decision. Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And when he did that, he paid a price for your sins. And, when, and because he did that, he rose again three days later. And that secured for you the opportunity to be part of the family of God. Amen. So if with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if that's you, you're ready to have your story rewritten. You want to start a new chapter. If you just slip up your hand on the count of three, if you're online as well, one, two, Three, is there anybody here you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you just slip your hand up real quick so I can see you. Everybody's heads are bowed. Amen. I think we're all family here. Well, thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, we're going to do announcements, and then they'll sing to lead us out. All right. as we prepare to wrap up today I just want to thank you all for being here thank you for embracing some of the different changes that we've made and uh, as we prepare to close I'm just going to ask you to continue to just pray throughout the week and be open to what the Holy Spirit's saying to us amen and uh, we know that sometimes change isn't easy and I honor all those who have been uh, in, in this church for, for years and years and years and we're building for generations you've been building for generations and we're going to be faithful, we're going to steward well, we're going to love everyone that walks in the door, everyone that's in the building.
just because there's changes all around us doesn't mean that there's changes with how we love people and how we love each other and how we love you. That's always going to be a critical piece. You're important. We're here to pastor you. We're here to care for you. So I want to encourage you is that, you know, I didn't like some of the changes at first. But after some time, they're growing for me because I'm looking after the greater good. Amen. And what's the greater good? It's that look at the little ones. Talk to the little ones. See what they think. And as we do that, we're going to continue to make changes and the Lord will help us together. I'm going to ask this, though. Don't let a paint color cause strife or division. Don't let some changes cause strife or division. Because that's the enemy's plan. And that might be a, something that we pray about, something we talk about. But we're not going to give the devil any place. Amen? Because we still want to see lives being healed and bodies being changed and things, all the different things. We still want God to move, but if there's division or strife, God won't be able to move like he wants to move. So guard your heart. Amen? As we uh, prepare to worship the Lord with our tithes and with our offerings, I just want to thank you for your continued faithfulness. And I want to share this with you is that some of the things that we have done in our church tithes, we give. We're generous. And we sowed into other building projects, other building renovations over the years. And the Bible says that the kingdom of God is like seed time and harvest. I believe in the blessing of God. I don't believe in hyper prosperity or things like that. No, I believe in the blessing of God. Because the blessing of God it makes us rich and has no sorrow with it. I don't believe in the folks selling a tie or selling water or selling all the different gimmicks that we might have seen on a TV station. But I believe in the blessing of the Lord that it makes us rich and it adds no sorrow with it. I believe in increase. I believe in seed time and harvest. So that's what we did. We've been sowing for years. And what God did this past week, he reminded me. That's the blessing. And some of you are like, it don't feel like a blessing. It feels like a curse right now. No, that's the blessing of the Lord because to do some of this, it, we got a quote of close to $30,000 just to paint the whole building. We didn't paint the whole building. We painted the sanctuary in the lobby. But God is faithful because he prepared a team and, 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 and dealt with someone's heart. I didn't make any phone calls, any conversations. Hey, do you have some people that can come help us? We need some help. No, God prepared the hearts of people and they came. And they said, if you get some people to come work with us, we'll do it. He's faithful. He's always on time. He sees the need before we ask and because we do ask and because we do give and because we are generous, he's always faithful to come through. Amen? So I want to encourage you to There'll be different ways to give on the screen right now. But thank you for your continued faithfulness. Um, you know, we have not had uh, fifth Sunday building offerings over the past few months just to prepare for maybe some changes like this and things like that. So if you want to sow, we encourage that. We appreciate that for sure. But we had a, a short window to make some changes even with technology and buying a new camera before the school comes in here um, in just a couple of short weeks. So um, if you'd like to be part of that, we're making probably about twenty-seven dollars to $30,000 um, and some adjustments here and some renovations. So, so as the Lord would lead you, amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. God, I thank you for every tither and every giver in this place, and I thank you that you're a faithful God. So God, I thank you that as people tithe and and they give offerings and they're generous. I thank you, Lord, for not money, but their heart. I thank you that as they give a percentage of their income, I thank you they have 100% of, of their heart. 
God, I thank you that, Lord, that the remaining part that's left over in their budget and their finances, that, God, that you would increase that, that you would stretch that, that you would cause it to be more than enough to take care of all their needs. God, you see the needs of your people and those who are looking for jobs or better jobs and the businessmen and women in this place. I thank you, Lord, that you would increase them, Father, that you would bless their business and bless what they put their hand to, Father, according to your word. So, God, we thank you for it. We bless you, but we worship you now with our tithes and with our offerings. And all God's people said...